We we have an extraordinary situation today where we discovered we've got 114 million more booster jabs apparently being ordered, looking like being jabbed. It wasn't instead of you know a, was it 15 million jabs to freedom for the, 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 the those over 70s who are most at risk? It's now basically jabs all the way till 2023 uh, by the looks of it. This even though the World Health Organization say that there's no evidence that boosters for the whole population does actually provide great protection and save lives. And as the early evidence, and we're not sure yet, we don't know for sure yet, but the early evidence for the Omicron variant does suggest that it is it does uh, spread more easily, it's more transmissible, but is not more deadly and indeed may well be much more mild. Um, and this at a time when the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen is talking about mandatory jabs across Europe. Tell us what you make of it all. Uh, well, I think we, um, the thing about uh, the virus is it's got, it's got into the brains and minds of, of, of people generally, and particularly obviously in governments, who are now reaching the point where they're sort of generally worried to be found to be caught out in not acting soon enough. Uh, so this latest variant, uh, because of the accusations of not acting quickly enough on other variants, suddenly led to everybody around the world doing some fairly knee-jerk stuff. I mean, shutting off uh, a developing country like South Africa, dependent on tourism and other things, um, when we don't and don't know at the moment what actually the uh, effect of this, uh, uh, this mutation is, does seem to me, from all the developed countries in the world, as a as a, 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 a something that you shouldn't have done straight away. So yeah. my concern is overreaction only to then find, do we have to unwind that? But the damage could be quite significant. So, I mean, we do know what do we, uh, the, the, the trouble with the, the sage and scientists is that you get two scientists now and please you get a whole number of different opinions about things. We don't know. And so whilst you don't know, there is an old principle uh, in our country, which was based on English common law, which is, uh, you tolerate and put up with and allow people to get on with their lives until you can prove and show demonstrably that it affects other people to the degree that it's detrimental, in yeah. which case then the law can move. But you, So it's called the proportionality principle. But now we seem to be bogged down in this EU precautionary principle, which says, oh, I don't know what could happen, but I tell you what, let's yeah. immediately move on the worst. That and, and that's the thing. We're always working on the worst case scenario. And this phrase, better safe than sorry. But the reality is these things don't necessarily make us safer because we go back into panic mode again. Um, and, and, and if we're going to do this over this new variant, when the evidence was not that it was, I mean, you know, we spoke to Angelique Curtsy, the, 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 the GP in South Africa and uh, chair of the British, of the sorry, South African Medical Board, um, saying, you know, the case they were finding were mild. It was, they well, believed, more transmissible, but, but mild. She's written a piece this week saying how the world is overreacting to this. Um, we are, we're going to put off countries actually identifying these variants and speaking out about them if we're going to have these knee-jerk reactions. And if we do this for this variant on the scant evidence we've got so far, we're going to do this for every variant. So, well, every three months we're going to be shutting down travel, going back to self-isolation and, and cancelling, you know, parties and, 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 and telling people to work from home. I mean, I've, I've said a year ago, if we if we go into another lockdown now, this is what we do every winter. And that's the fear that a lot of people have, isn't it? Yes, my instinct is that we won't be ending up in a lockdown because the evidence will become overwhelmingly clear uh, that we've misunderstood the nature of what was going on in places like South Africa. Number one, they just don't have as many people vaccinated as we do. So uh, I think the total proportion is about 20 percent. So when you start to examine, oh, my God, they're all spiking and they're getting more and more infection, which is because they're not vaccinated. So almost all of the people going into hospital uh, there are always going to be exceptions to this uh, in, in places like Africa, are actually people who aren't vaccinated. Uh, it's the case actually here too, by the way, which is if you look at the figures, once you strip away everything else, the hospitalizations and sadly deaths tend to be um, massively so those who have not had a vaccine yeah. to their choice. Uh, but that's the case. So so we get the balance of this right. I, I was told by a scientist the other day, if you think about a... Uh, as a um, uh, uh, something like a virus, you you need to think of it in terms of how we behave. So, a virus ultimately mutates almost always uh, downwards in potency and yeah. upwards in infection. And there's a reason for that. It's the virus itself needs to survive, and therefore it keeps killing its host. It's not going to survive. So it wants to 
be able to live with a host yeah. but at the same yeah. time. Yeah, people, people getting over. seriously ill and being at home uh, is no use to the virus because it can't then spread. They want you to be one out and about walking around. So either common cold has done so well, isn't it? Let me, let me talk about, you talk about, you know, people's choice. Now, you know, the vaccine, undoubtedly, the data's really clear. The vaccine saves lives. I, you know, I'm, I'm double jabbed, very happy to be double jabbed. Um, people are getting the boosters. I mean, the World Health Organization did question whether or not whole populations uh, should need the boosters and, the, and, you know, whether actually it'd be a rather more moral actually to give out any any excess vaccines uh, to people who are desperately in need for their first jab in the in poorer countries but the question of mandatory jabs now seems to become something that is perfectly acceptable to talk about it's happened in uh in italy even just to go to work whatever your job is uh, it's happened in australia greece fining those over 60s 100 euros a month if they don't get jabbed let's have a listen to what the european commission president ursula von der leyen had to say at a press conference yesterday one third of the european population is not vaccinated these are 150 million people this is a lot and not each and every one can be vaccinated, so they are very small children, for example, or people with special medical conditions, but the vast majority could. And therefore, I think um, it is understandable and appropriate to lead this discussion now, um, how we can encourage and potentially think about mandatory vaccination um, within the European Union. This needs discussion. This needs um, a common approach, but it is a discussion that I think has to be led. Um, said so calmly by, you know, a nicely well-dressed, you know, middle-class woman, um, uh, Sir Indung Smith. And yet this is extraordinarily authoritarian, totalitarian stuff, isn't it? Well, it's, I think it's a problem, really, because uh, the moment you slide down the road of saying you must do something, yeah. which is almost impossible to police. So what are we going to do? Let's say logically, we should, before we open our mouths, ask ourselves what's, what happens uh, following that. So you mandate someone, they must have a vaccination. So um, what if they don't? Are you going to arrest them? Yeah. Are you going to fine them? And what if they don't care and don't pay the fine? Will you then put them in jail? This is, you know, this begin, then begins to become complex, bureaucratic, and almost impossible to enforce. So my answer is, you know, the, the truth of things like medication, vaccines, etc., uh, man, mandating people to take them almost invariably doesn't work, and it creates worse resentment uh, and distrust. And then what happens if somebody takes it and they have one of those very rare occurrences of a blood clot, as we were hearing today about AstraZeneca, which, by the way, is, is a, a, an excellent vaccination, yeah. Uh, but what happens if they then suffer? So who's responsible for that? <laughs> because they didn't have a choice. So yeah. my point is that, you know, under, I keep coming back, I'm afraid, to the structure of our law. The basis of all of our law has been this brilliant system called English common law, which errs on the side of saying constantly, unless I can prove that what, you, what, what you're doing is damaging other people dramatically and uh, and very clearly, then I leave you to get on with your life and hope that basically yeah. common sense will prevail and and extol the virtues of the better course of action. And that's, I think, always a good place for us to be. It's, it's uh, Exactly. It's, it's, I do find it extraordinary, particularly the number of people in public domain, particularly those who are you know, clinically obese, telling people they have to get a jab because of all the pressure on the NHS. It's a bit rich, isn't it? Yes. And, I mean, the truth is that the, the problem we've got with all of these arbitrary processes is that they have consequences. And as we've seen with the lockdown, the, what was the biggest consequence of the lockdowns was that uh, hospitals didn't take uh, critical patients. The result is that people will have died because of heart disease uh, or cancer treatment, which they didn't get. Um, and there's a huge waiting list now as a result of people not being able to get their own treatments. And so, yeah. you know, these are not consequence free yeah so i do absolutely. wish more people would open their mouths and yes exactly better safe than sorry as i said not always that safe just finally I want to ask you about christmas parties boris johnson um three times yesterday failed to deny that there had been christmas parties uh, on the 18th of december london was in tier three you weren't allowed to have parties in tier three the next day he announced tier four uh, you weren't even allowed to mix with other households um we had parties we know a leaving party in november that's not even been denied uh, where boris johnson spoke at 
Downing Street press conference, uh, sorry, lobby briefing yesterday, um, an extraordinary transcript of that, which I've actually tweeted out yesterday, where um, they're sort of saying, well, these aren't, this, is, this is not a description we recognise. And the report is actually forced to actually ask, you know, if there's music, a quiz, nibbles and drink, does that count as a party or not? Um, what do you make of, uh, undoubtedly, I'm sorry, I know how these things work. I was a lobby journalist for years. There were parties in number 10. Groups of up to 40 to 50 people in a room. At a time when families were being told they couldn't see each other. People were being told to work from home. Uh, people were being banned from having Christmas with their families. And Downing Street were just having parties. What do you make of that? Well, I'll be honest with you, Julian. I haven't even thought about it at all because uh, I think there's some other things going on. I, I, I have no idea whether there was a party at Downing Street. I understood there to have been a denial. No, there wasn't was a denial. Case, following no. that original uh, statement. But, I, you know, all I can say is that uh, if the rules at the time were no parties and there were parties, then somebody needs to be hauled over the coals for it. But um, my genuine sense is I honestly don't know one way or the other. I, I haven't been into Downing Street for a while. Oh, actually, that's not true. I went in to have a meeting the other day, but not with the Prime Minister. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I you know, honestly don't know. So all I can say is if it is true, well, then somebody needs to uh, to own up for it. I think they need to. I think they need to go. But there we are. That's just me. I'm old-fashioned. I'm I'm old school. Ian Doug Smith. Ian Doug Smith. So appreciate you joining us. Thank you very much.